You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast, bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. This week, my guest is author E.E. E. Georgie. Well, thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Author Stories Podcast. My very special guest this week is E.E. E. Georgie. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You are very welcome. And uh, why don't you give our listeners a an introduction to you and how it is that you came uh, to the world of writing, and uh, and then we'll dig into your books and your uh, your other many things that you do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sure. Um, well, I know it sounds uh, boring and predictable, but I, I have been writing my entire life. What what I guess it's different is that um, I I grew up in Italy, and so I started writing in Italian. Um, in high school, I was writing short stories um, and sending them off to magazines and stuff and getting, getting lots of rejections. Um, when I moved to the U.S. for graduate school, I had um, sort of a language pause, <laughs> language confusion. Um, and then I started writing again um, just a few years ago, and it just came in English, and it was... You know, all those stories that I had been accumulating for all these years, they just wanted to come out all of a sudden. And um, so I I wrote a book in, in just a few months, and it sucked because it was my first book, and it was the first one I had written in English. Right. Um, I, I guess that's common, right, that the first book is something you just write for, for exercise, I guess, and then you put it in a drawer and you leave it there. <laughs> Unless you're um, some sort of freak of nature that, you know, just, well, no, just magically true. produces, you know, That's true. Hits, some, some you know. people can pull it off. Um, yeah. It wasn't me. <laughs> it, it, it isn't many people, uh, yeah. And but I, I think what, what, what truly inspired me was um, I started studying genetics and um, I guess I'm a complete nerd. I, I I was so fascinated by genetics, and I thought, you know, there's so many monsters and mythology that uh, spur a lot of um, fantastic stories, but genetic can do that too because you start thinking, wow, this could happen for real. And and of course, you you, you take a little poetic license and you push it a little bit, but. Um, it's it's amazing the stuff you can come up with and so that's when I was truly inspired to write what I consider my first novel which is my uh, debut Camaras um, the main character has a genetic twist and it was totally inspired by um, the science I do at work um, I guess I went off a ramble but um, no that that's perfect uh, you mentioned that. Uh, genetics is such a fascinating subject because the things that uh, that can go wrong in those stories can really go wrong in real life that that to me yeah. is the scariest kind of story is the one that that knows that the quote unquote evil is lurking just around the corner that is true but it's also um I don't know. To me, it's fascinating to sort of push all the, those buttons and start thinking, well, what if this could happen, you know? And, and of course, it, it, it's not true that it can happen, absolutely. Like, I, I, work, um, I work mostly on viruses, and so I tend to extend stuff from viruses to humans, and, and it's clearly not possible. But it, it, it's fun, in a way, to, um, you know, explore all those possibilities. Um, what inspired my book, Camara, was the fact that I learned that um, as we evolve as species, it's not like our, our DNA, um, we have, it's not like we have new genes in our DNA, we just modify the genes and, and keep all the old ones. So the, the DNA grows from one species to the next because we keep all the old stuff and it just becomes inactivated, right? So to me, the idea that we still have all those genes that our predator ancestors had is just mind-boggling, right? Because what if we could activate them again? Um, that, that was my one idea that kept me thinking for months. 
Um, because you know how people invent vampires and all that stuff, which is, it's fun. All the mythology, of course, it's, is very inspiring. But then you think, well, we do have predators in our genes, right? We have them for real. Right. So, so it's kind of, yeah, the, 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 the science that I do at work is what um, gets me going writing. Now, you said that you have always been a writer, and uh, I've met lots of writers and storytellers uh, through this podcast and through uh, you know talking with other writers, and most of them say that they've always been a writer. They, they might yes. not have sat down at the keyboard and pounded out a story, but they've always been writers. There's there's a gene in them if we could you know, borrow <laughs> yeah. from from what you do uh but and you pursued um professionally something that is is very different from what most writers would pursue professionally um and i'll try to see how many alliterations i can make in a row there uh but was writing something that you always came back to, even in your studies? Uh, was that a, an outlet for you to channel some of your academic frustration and things like that? Yeah, I, th I think you you nailed it. Um, yes, it's um, like I said, I had um, a long pause, but it was mostly because you know, you, you, you grow up with one language, then you get immersed in a new culture and a new language, and suddenly you're kind of figuring out your words all over again. And, and it's fun, I, I have to admit. Um, but, but I was still writing in a way because what, what I did for a few years, I wrote for a local um, journal. I was doing um, popular science articles, you know, trying to explain the science uh, I, I was working on to um, to a broad audience. Um, so so and and that helps because um, doing scientific research is quite frustrating. I know when I talk to people, they all tell me, "Oh, that is so cool. What you do is fascinating." But I, I would say ninety nine percent of the time is pure frustration because you come up with ideas and they don't work and the experiment fails and the model doesn't run. You know, there's there's a lot of trying and failing that goes on. And so it's true that writing gives you an outlet and and more, more than an outlet, more than the, I'm sorry, more than the writing itself is the letting your mind explore all those what if questions you know because then all of a sudden you let your imagination free and and it helps from all those constraints then that i was mentioning before the, the experiment the model the the computer program and all that so so it, it is indeed a, a great help um that way. I, did I answer your yes, question? Or? Yes, uh, you sure did. Uh, you bring something to the table that uh, not many writers get to, and I've only gotten to talk to one other writer so far that is not a native English speaker, uh, yeah, and that I, was Stefan Bolt. Yes, uh, and, I've enjoyed that book. Yes, book and uh, Stefan's such an amazing guy, uh, but he yes. natively speaks German, and he told me and he'll correct me if I'm wrong or if I get one of the nuances wrong, that uh, he is not able to write as fluidly in German as he does in English. Uh, have you noticed a difference like that in, in one language or the other? Maybe for you it's Italian. Or, uh, but is there a difference for you in the different languages? Absolutely. You know, a lot of my Italian friends, they keep telling me, you have to translate your book. You have to write it in Italian. And I told them, you know, you translate it. I can't. At this point, I, I don't think I could. Um, in fact, I, I always joke about this, but I think that being bilingual doesn't mean that you're fluent in two languages. It means that you can't speak either language perfectly anymore. You know, um, I go home. And I my never looked at it that way. Me, well, to me, at least, it's true. Like well, sure. one thing 
that I find truly, truly confusing in both languages now is prepositions. They kill me, I swear. Wow. I can't get them right. So, I, in fact, I should apologize uh, for, for if I screw up any prepositions in this hour. I, I know a uh, lot of native English speakers that uh, still struggle with prepositions, so don't feel bad. Okay, <laughs> that's good to hear in a way. Uh, what um, do you find uh, – you were talking about translating, and I think that's something that a lot of readers would mm -hmm. probably take for granted, uh, that we, we see a writer who's written a book, and it's been translated into 50 different languages. Mm -hmm. uh, what is – have you translated any of your works uh, back to Italian? No, no, I don't um... – no, I don't. I don't think I could. You know, um, translating is very different. Re requires some skills that um, you don't necessarily have as a fluent speaker of the language. Um, it. I. I don't know. I really admire, especially those people who um, translate live. You know, when when you see um, at public events and stuff like that. I. I really don't think I could. Plus, I've. One thing that I've I really enjoy about um, speaking two uh, languages is that there are things that cannot be translated. Um, in fact, in our, our family, we often we often mix up things because there are some idioms, for example, that you just can't translate. Specifically, and, I was going to ask you about idioms and and maybe figures of speech that that don't carry over. Yeah, and, and that's hard, and I honestly don't know how they do that when they translate books or movies or stuff like that. I I, I really don't know. Um, I guess in my case, I'm just mentally lazy, and I don't want to know. I just I appreciate it so much that there are these idioms that I know and that I can use, even though, you know, in either, I, I can just bounce back and forth, and, and I, I have... It's a richness that um, that it's embedded in bilingual uh, uh, environments, and 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 you know I think uh, we should all go in that directions, and and um, because it it's really a richness, and and I love it that for example a lot of my Italian friends actually are, are reading my books in in, in English and. I've sold books in Germany, in Spain, in Japan. I've sold a book in Japan. And I think it's awesome. I, I, I hope that we're all going in that direction, that we can embrace more languages. And, and Because by doing that, we also embrace more cultures, right? Yes. So, Do you think the connected nature of, uh, of the world these days uh, with the – with the internet and all of our other communications medium mediums, do you think that's kind of brought some of those barriers down? Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it, it has. I mean, I see it in my own life, you know, like I've been in the U.S. now 15 years, and, and 15 years ago it was much more difficult to communicate with, um, to keep in touch with my um, family and friends. Um but aside from from my own, you know, family experience, it it's been great to through this networking to get to know readers all over the world. It's just it it's awesome, really. Um, it it brings us all together, you know, together. Um, not just through books, but but through any actually. Um, creativity medium that you have out there you know um, I do photography too and and I put up I post my photographs and I get in touch with people throughout the world with that so it, it, it's really nice it's it, I don't know how to say it but <laughs> that's wonderful well, let's switch gears for a moment and talk about your uh, your first book uh, Chimera how did you get the idea for that first book right so like like I was saying, it was um, the the idea spurred from a book that I was reading. That it, it, it was a vampire book that I I confess I did not like, but I was intrigued by the idea of 
a predator who falls in love with his prey, right? So I, I loved the idea, but then I thought that the book didn't quite um, successfully portray it because the, the predator in that case wasn't, to me, it wasn't scary enough. So, so at the same time, I remember being in this conference call at work and I had a colleague who started saying, this virus is a chimera, it's a chimera. And I had no idea what it meant, I confess. So I went and looked it up and, and what I, that, that's when I learned what I was um, mentioning before, that we have all these genes in our DNA that um, we don't use them anymore, but we've inherited them from our ancestors, right? So every time you move from one species to the next, you keep all these genes and our, what our cells do, they copy them, but they keep the old copies. So I kept thinking, well, we have all these genes that could potentially make us into predators, but they're just inactivated, right? They just, they simply don't work. Um, in fact, the majority of our DNA that doesn't do, well, I shouldn't say this, but it's not genes, okay? So that got me into the idea that um, in, instead of doing vampires, we could really create a predator, a human predator, just by using genetics. And um, so that's how it, the idea came about. And then I thought, you know, the most ancestral genes that we have are the olfactory receptors. Basically, you know, our predators when they were hunting, they were relying heavily on their sense of smell. So I created this human being who has some heavily screwed up genes, <laughs> to put it <laughs> plainly, but he can smell really, his sense of smell is um, heightened. And so then from there, I thought a person like that would be great, great at investigating crimes. And, and from there, I ended up writing a murder mystery, which is funny because the premise is more science fiction, I guess. Um, but uh, I don't know actually how, how I ended up writing a murder <laughs> mystery, but I, I confess, you know, it's one of those things that when you think back, you can't quite retrace the logic. But I had so much fun because I, I knew all the genetics by then. But what I didn't know was the, the police stuff. And, and I met this um, retired uh, police officer from the LAPD in Los Angeles. And he was so much fun to talk to. And, and so um, I guess by then I was so fascinated with, with the lingo and the way they operate um, my my. Uh, police uh, friend, he, he told he was telling me all these stories, and it was just a lot of fun. It, it, you, you know, I, at first I had just this jumble in my head of notions, but then it all came out into this story that um, that I, I, I still like. I think it, it's it, especially the the main character because. He's a person with um, internal conflict, and and I like that in in characters because I think it's the story of of everybody's life. There's no cutting clean good or cutting clean evil. We're all a mix of both. We're all struggling with this as we search who we are, and so it, it, it's it's one of the themes in in my books that um, you never know who the real bad guy is and who the real good guy is. When you started writing Chimera, did you uh, did you outline uh, the whole book before you started writing? Did you did you have a mental image of where the book was going to go before you set out or did you just kind of discover the story as you as you wrote it? I pretty much discovered the story as I as I write, um, which which is why I said I had a huge jumble in my head, but it it did <laughs> this. But but it um it it's strange really. I, I um because, you know, as methodic as I am at work, because you know science needs to be methodic and rigorous I guess it, it links to what we were saying before, that writing becomes this outlet where you completely free the imagination, you let it go. And and 
somehow for me at least it works this way i know i know not all writers uh do this i mean i i know some friends of mine they just have to sit down and and plot the whole thing from beginning to end or else they can't write for me is um it's really mostly about getting to know the characters um i want to I kind of think about them a lot, and 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 then I, I write a scene here and a scene there, uh, mostly dialogues, just to see what where, where they're going in my head, and then it pretty much comes together at at the end, which is still amazing to me because <laughs> if you look at my process, it's totally chaotic, but so far I've written um four books and i've written them all like this and and so i figured by now it works i don't know and, and if it's not broken don't fix it for sure I, uh, right. now, you did not set out to self-publish that first book did you right right that's uh, that's true actually um I, I finished cameras in 2011 in the at, at the end of the summer and I remember I was very excited sending out those uh, first query letters and to agents because you know that's how I, I read you were supposed to do. And and actually uh, that part went pretty well because I got uh, within three months I had a uh, an offer from an agent and after that I had I ended up having eight offers of representation, um, which is way too many. I couldn't choose. <laughs> That's a really it's great funny. problem to have. I, I guess it is. But, um, you know, um, going back, for example, I, I would choose agents. I, I would like the questions I was asking them. I, I didn't even know what to ask. And, and now I think uh, I would know exactly what to ask like one thing you want to ask an agent is how do you pitch the book um do you sit down at lunch with editors do you call them how do you do that and i was completely clueless um but i at the same time like you said it's a good problem to have um i i i signed up with an agent um with whom i was for one year and then i i i switched to a second agent for another full year and after two years, um, the, the strange thing that was happening is that editors, were, acquiring editors, were coming back with um, compliments, but also requests. Um, so they wanted some changes made. And I've always thought that, you know, these are the experts in the field, so they, they must know what they're doing. So if they ask something, it, it's for a good reason, but I would go back and and to me in the end it's all always seemed like they wanted to pull my story to one genre or the other, and it's true that this story I told you the premise so you can already guess it's not it's not a science fiction and it's not it's mostly a mystery but it has so many science elements that you could say. It is a science fiction, even though it doesn't quite fit the box. And so I think what was happening is that they weren't quite comfortable putting my book in a specific category. And and after two and a half years, um, my second agent started um, submitting to small publishers. But in the meantime, the publishing world has had changed so much. And, you know, I started thinking... With a small publisher, you really have to do all the promotion yourself. You have to, you know, do a lot of work on your own. And I started meeting self-published published authors who were pretty successful at doing this. It, it, it requires time, of course, and it's a bit of a risk-taking choice. But to me, it made sense. It made a lot more sense than just going with a publisher who's just trying out the waters in, in a sense. So I told my agent, you know, I don't want you to submit it anymore. I'm just going to go on my own. And 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 I have no regrets whatsoever. It, it is a hard path to take. It, it requires a lot of work. I'm, I'm constantly promoting. I have much less time to write because of all the promotion I have to do. But one, I, I've met 
a lot of authors, including you. It's it's fantastic, and and um, in this solidarity between us, it, it's really great. So I feel like I'm part of a community, and and we always. Um, help one another, give feedback to one another. At, and so so that's one advantage. The second advantage is that I, I, I do like being more in control. Um, I've made, um, except for the first cover, the, the book cover of Camara, which a, a really good photographer friend of mine did, but the other ones I made myself and I love it. I, I can choose exactly what I want for one thing, then I love that I can choose my publishing schedule I, I um, when I want to put the book out. And then I feel like I'm more directly in touch with my readers because I, I do all the promotions, so I get in touch with them. I, uh, I have a, a newsletter like all authors <laughs> should do, and I love it. It's, it's a lot personal. and. I, I don't know. Plus, I confess that um, I, I also have friends who are traditionally published, and it it's really hard even through that route to be successful. And not only that, I've heard some horror stories on their end too. So it it it's not guaranteed that you go with a pub, big publisher and and it's all easy and you're going to be successful. So. It, it's a lot of work either way, and between the two, I'd rather be in a community that I like and be in control of all the aspects of publishing. Well, sure, and uh, like you said, uh, publishing is a lot of work either way, and I've talked to so many um, traditionally published authors now who have told me the same thing, that their publisher expects them to do the majority of the marketing work. Yeah, uh, and you know, as self-published authors, we're already doing that, and exactly, you know, uh, so, it, and for sure, the uh, one decision is not right across the board. Uh, each one needs to come to that decision on their own and, right. and take whichever path is better for them. Uh, but I think that the takeaway from that is that the stigma of self-publishing is nearly completely gone away. It, Absolutely, yes. Yeah. You, you, you used the right word. It used to be a stigma, but it's not anymore. Look at how no. many people are, are having success. And I don't think at this point readers care who published your book. No. They care that your book is good because they want a good story. And, and especially when you have books that don't fit any specific genre. Uh, another author you interviewed is Michael Bunker, right? Yes. He, he His books don't fit a specific genre, no. and, and yet his readers love them, right? So so I strongly feel that let the readers decide, right? That's right. That, that's what self-publishing has given us. So. And I'm so. hearing this a lot from authors now who, and, and I'm not exactly sure, I can't put my finger on where the change is happening or, or why the change is happening but we're seeing a lot of new stories come out that are cross genre or just do not fit in in a box at all and i think that's a really exciting thing because now we're able to get a story like uh chimeras that comes out or we're we're able to get a story like pennsylvania from michael bunker right uh, because whoever would have imagined amish science fiction exactly you know? exactly but these, yeah. because those walls have come down and the freedom has been placed uh you know the power has been placed in the hands of the people you're free to to create stories like that, and I think that the reading community uh, is better for it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. So when you told your uh, your agent that you were just going to self publish, did they give you any advice? Or did they try to dissuade you, or did they encourage you? Um, neither, I guess. Um. My my agent, she's still my agent, I should say, and and I love her. She she um she tried she she really believed. She still believes in in Camaras and um she loves the story. Um, no, she she did tell me it's hard, 
but but more and more people are doing it. So so she was not at all opposed to it. Um, we're, we're still in touch because I, I tell her, you know, how many copies I, I've, I've sold and I give her <laughs> updates. And um, from from what I hear, I, I think that um, agents are adapting to meaning that they're they're looking for books who are doing well that are doing well on Amazon and and looking for authors that way. I'm I'm curious. I haven't had a chance to to ask my agent, but I I suspect that they're seeing much of a less uh, volume of emails in their inbox. That's my um, guess. That that less people are querying because they just wanna try out self-publishing and and then they query afterwards maybe I, I don't know that would be a fascinating conversation to have with the uh, yeah. agent now to see what what the landscape it, has, has changed for them. I did ask her if if I could interview her but she, she's really busy right like like all agents are right. so it's hard to um, have a, a a long conversation with them in general but so you um you queried that book for uh, for three years, or the, uh, the process of that book would... of submission. Of so submission. I queried it for for three months with agents, uh, right. um, which is pretty fast, actually. That's so, actually so really it, fast. Yeah, yeah I, I was amazed, and I thought naively that that was the hard part, right? Getting an agent, and once you have an agent, the book will be published. I had no doubt, and no, unfortunately, the book was on submission for. A little over two years. Um, I had one editor who read the whole book and she loved it, but she told me specific. I know she read the whole book because she had some really good comments on the ending, and and in fact, I made some revisions based on her comments. Um, and and that was um, flattering already that a, a busy acquiring editor um, from a, this was a big publisher. Um, that would take the time to read the whole book, right? Right. But then it was devastating in a way because she told me clearly that um, she couldn't um, acquire it as a as a straight mystery and she couldn't acquire it as a science fiction. And so she suggested completely changing the story. Not, not completely, but um, taking out all the science and making it um, true science fiction. But... I, I thought that would have ruined the story. I thought that would have taken away what was what's unique of this um, story. So it wouldn't be your story anymore, would it? Yeah, exactly. And and you know what? I think that readers can tell. You know, because I I, I do think that um, the best stories come out spontaneously, and and you know you 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 get to know these characters and write them and. And, and I think if you start making two changes that you don't feel are right, but you're just doing it for the market, I think in the end the readers will be able to tell and the story will just won't read the same way. So I don't know. Now, you, you said that uh, as, you, uh, as your agent queried to different publishers, you started getting a lot of feedback on, on what uh, people would want to change. Uh, and, and maybe I read this in, in a blog post that you wrote. Uh, you said that you were you were getting feedback. It's sometimes two different people telling you to to make two completely different changes. Yes, <laughs> that is that has to be such a frustrating uh, experience. It, it was in a way, you know. I, I kept thinking that there's something wrong with my story. But if they can't, if, if they were all hitting the same nail, then then I would know for sure, right? This right. is wrong with my story, and I have to make this big revision. But they kept wanting one thing or the other. Like in one case, it was too many descriptions, and you know, I now I reckon that some of it was right. You know, the first novel, I kind of you, you get lengthy, or or at least I I think I did, but. But the, 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 in that case, I, I remember the, the feedback that came was like, remove all the descriptions. And, and that I thought, no, it's too much. I can remove some, but not too. Or, but then another one was all, was, 
at, at the opposite, like it was, it was, you know, I, I, I forget the details, but it was something like the dialogues were too much. And, and I thought, no, that doesn't, I, I don't know. But, but yeah, there were a few that were quite opposite. And so, oh, and I had one that asked me to change my detective into a woman. And that I thought, no, sorry. <laughs> I know, you know. Well, if you're like me, uh, when when I write a story, I usually um, I, I walk around with these characters in my head for a while before yes, I start yes. writing the story. Absolutely. And I, I, I kind of straddle the fence between being an outliner and being a discovery writer. Uh, I usually plan out some scenes, and I know where the story's going to go, and I generally know the ending, and I pretty much know how I'm going to get there, but all of the preparation for writing the story goes on in my head. I, I just, like I, I've said before, I just walk around with these characters in my head and get to know them and put them in situations and see how they'll react and things like that. And yes, I, I to, totally relate to And that. to me, yes. they are real people. They are, yeah. they are people that I know inside and out. And that if someone were to tell me, you know what, you really need to swap genders on this character <laughs> – I, I, I would be incredulous. I could just imagine. It feels wrong. It <laughs> does. Yeah. It, I, that would, you know, it would be like asking me to trade in one of my children. I, you know, that's just, it <laughs> yep. was just would be wrong. Um, you said that you have published four books now. What came after Chimeras? Um, published actually three okay. so far. I'm... So, so after Chimeras came Mosaics, um, which is the sequel, uh, but you know they can they're mysteries and they're they, so they can both be standalones. Uh, it's a sequel in terms of characters um, growing from okay. Camaras to mosaics. Um, and it's it's called the title is mosaics because if you look at genetics, the the two the Camaras and the mosaics they go hand in hand. They're just two forms of having mixed DNAs. So. So that it's funny because for that book, for that second book, I knew exactly the title, but I had no plot, no ideas whatsoever. But I knew it had to be mosaics because it naturally comes after chimeras. But um, and and then um, so I I wrote mosaics while chimeras was in submission the first year, and then by the second year I started thinking, well, maybe this is not happening, and so I wrote something completely different, which is my third book, um, Gene Cards. And, and it's still inspired by science. Um, I, in, Gene Cards is a darker book because I, I think I ended up putting in there all my fears about the future. And, and in fact, it is um, based in a near future. Um, I imagine, you know, a place where the internet completely takes over, you know, um, companies like Google's, they, they tend to um, spy on us in a way. I mean, I know they offer a lot of services and like we were saying before, all these platforms, they really connect us together. So they give wonderful services, but it comes at a, at a price, which is our privacy, right? right? They take data from us every time we connect um, to the Internet. And so I imagine this future, future where there's no privacy, um, where um, there's no privacy not even in our DNA, because that's another thing that I see happening, um, that the technology to sequence DNA is um, getting better and better and faster and cheaper. And so I started thinking, well, what if all these health insurance companies um, will all want our DNA with the excuse that it's for our health, you know, it, it provides better prognostics and stuff like that. But then what are they going to do with all this DNA? Is it really just for medical reasons or can they use the data? And and so that's how um, gene cards came about. And, and of course, this time I did have a heroine, in, uh, um, a female main character instead of a man. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, if it's set in the future, nobody's going to complain. 
about the genre, <laughs> meaning right. that it's definitely a science fiction. Um, yeah, and that's uh, my third book. My fourth book, I don't know if I'm going to publish. I'm still thinking about it. But that's the beauty of self-publishing, right? I can it, choose. It sure is. Uh, do you... Uh, are you going to continue with the characters uh, f uh, from your first book? I I want to, though. Right now, um, I have them paused <laughs> in a way. It's it's hard to write a mystery because I keep thinking everything has been done already. Like um, you know, serial killers, robberies. It, so it. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm playing with some ideas, mm -hmm. but um, every time I come up with something in my head, and there's a voice in me that says, done already, <laughs> you know, that kind of yeah. I think we all so, have that voice in our head. Yeah, yeah, so we just have to tell the voice to shut uh, up. So your day job, you uh, work with uh, genetics and also uh, with infectious diseases is that correct yes yeah is it difficult for you to watch zombie uh tv shows <laughs> yes <laughs> I, I can imagine uh does does the science uh cross lines with science fiction uh for you too often ah uh, that, that's a really good question so so i i do love a good scientific premise because you know that that's what I do in my books too, but but I I also get really picky. Um, actually, more than zombies, you know, I do read zombie books because the neuroscience is really fascinating. Um, what gets me though is that is the genetics. Like, there's a lot of science fiction out there where the premise is just you know you create beings from um, you know taking a gene here and a gene there and putting them together. That Those are the ones that I can't. Because I, I, I've read so many papers and, and um, on how it just doesn't work like that. And and I know that it's tempting. It's, it's really cool to think that we can make cross beings and, you know, like the movie Splice. I, I don't know. It's, it's a science fiction movie. Like, so those... That kind of premise um, gets me because it, it, it's never going to happen. We're so much more complicated that, than what's written in our genes. Um, our, our genes are actually only 20% of our DNA. And people used to think that the remaining 80% was completely useless. And it's not. It turns out it plays a role, and, and which is why we're so unique every single individual is unique and even twins um even though they're identical they're unique they're not you know supposedly their dna's are identical but they're really different people when you get to know them right so so that's why i, I for me the idea that we're unique individual and so not predictable is so ingrained that those are the things that get me in science fiction. So um, they, they sort of ruin the story in a way, right? <laughs> right. Because at that point, it, it pulls me off. Well, that brings but, up a great question for me because uh, in the past, science fiction has informed science uh, from uh, you know, space travel and things like that. And sometimes when science fiction is written, it is not physically possible to make something happen, but uh, we've heard stories of scientists that were inspired by science fiction to then yeah. go and try things. And I I understand that the the science of genetics is a completely different thing, and and there seem to be some hard and fast rules that are just not going to be broken. Uh, but how do you think um, we can approach science fiction in light of those barriers? Um, well, one thing that I have been enjoying very much is, um, in my blog, I, I discuss a lot of, uh, science paper, right? Um, and I've been approached by many writers who just ask me questions 
um, lately, um, Chris Porteau, whom you've also interviewed, um, and, and, and I, I love having these uh, dialogues, um, because, at, because, well, one, I'm a writer, and then I'm, I'm a scientist. So for me, it's, it's all about bringing the two together. So I tend not to be close minded in terms of, you know, this is the science and it has to be rigorous because I'm also a writer and I know that it's, it's beautiful to explore all those um, questions in, in your head. Right. But, but I think this dialogue, it, it is beautiful because um, as a, as a writer, you, you want to make your story plausible. And, and again, it's not about, scientific rigor right that that is a restricted to the scientific paper so I, I don't mean it in that sense but it it's nice to to make it credible and believable and and because then it makes to me it makes a much more interesting story because you know especially when when you explore what could happen in the future for example isn't it fun if you know somebody 20 years from now reads your book and says, wow, how did they know, you know? So, or, or, or even now for a reader to say, wow, that could really happen. I, I, I think it makes for a richer and deeper story. So, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm rambling again, but I guess the, the, what I mean to say is that there needs to be a dialogue and, and I hope that there can, there's, open doors for this dialogue between writers and, and, and scientists. And, and I think, I, I think for writers to go to seminars, for example, uh, but also for scientists and, <clears throat> excuse me, this is harder, but, but I, I wish I could see more scientists um, talking about their science not just to their peers, but to uh, uh, to everybody, to a broader audience. Um, I see that a lot in the blogging community. There's a lot of scientists who blog, and and I think that's very important because that way, that's how we we keep the dialogue going. Sure. Well, I come from an an IT background, and any time that I see a movie with hackers, I just roll my eyes because oh. I, you know. Uh, so I think there's a a place for uh, writing something with integrity toward the science, right. but at the same time allowing some room for for wonder and for the what might be possible. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. there's it's it's a fine balance, sure. right? Sure, so it is. Uh, what advice would you give to uh, someone who wanted to write their first novel? Hmm. Um, well, write it, <laughs> um, and by that I mean, because it's, it's really easy to get overwhelmed by, um, self-doubt and like we were saying before, questions like, oh, it's been done before or, you know, so I, I think the first approach should be just write it, think of it as it's in you and you need to get it out of the system. Um, and then when you go back and, and you edit and, you know, it's in, in your second pass, let all those doubts come back, not because you, your story is bad, but because you want to make it better. But if you let all those doubts creep in, well, while you're writing your first draft, then you, you might not finish. So, so the, the first draft should be written, you know, without listening to anything, just write it. And then be open to feedback um, when, you, when you go back and add it. Um, this is for the writing part. Um, publishing is another story. I don't know if you want me to go there sure. too. Or I guess I'm still learning, though. So, yeah. would you encourage someone to uh, pursue self-publishing? 
right now I'm really biased toward self-publishing. Um, you know, the, the truth is that every every not just every author is different, but every book is different. That is also true. Meaning, you know, what might work for one book doesn't necessarily work for another book. But I, right now, if somebody were to come to me and ask me, should I query or should I just go ahead and self-publish? I would probably say just self-publish, um, because I think. That's where the future of publishing is going. Um, I won't deny that it's it's hard, um, but but like we were saying before, going with a big publisher is also hard. It's, there's no guarantee that your life is going to be easier as an author. Um, right. So either way it's hard work so you have to be passionate about it and you have to believe in your story and in in yourself as a storyteller right, right. um and I, I guess the most important thing is to have a plan um to explore both uh worlds and make a decision and and have a plan meaning not just the one book that I want to publish, but you want to look at yourself 10 years from now as an author, where do you want to be? And and I think, I think if you can answer that question, then you'll know whether you want to go self-publishing or not. Well, and the more I sit here and think about your advice to writers, uh, in its simplicity is, is brilliant, that uh, just write the novel. Because I don't know how many people I've met that call themselves aspiring writers. Uh, and the only difference between an aspiring writer and a writer is one sits down in the chair and writes. <laughs> yes, and, yes. And overcoming that self-doubt and overcoming the perceived obstacles to that uh, is really the hard part. And, and then when you publish, you know, laying all of your soul bare – to the yes. <laughs> to the world yes. and oh. and and that struggle is there whether you self publish or traditionally publish it's, exactly you, you, the, both struggles are there whether each way, either way you go you've got to sit in the chair and write and then you have to expose yourself to everyone um, so yeah. that's that's great advice uh, e e Georgie it has been a wonderful hour talking mm -hmm. with you where can people find you, you online to connect with you and to buy your work. So my blog, if you Google Camera blog, um, it, sh my, my, it should be the one that comes up first. Um, and I, I, I have all my contact information in there and, and my links to the books. And I, I use my blog to talk about my three great passions, which is writing, photography, and science. So it's a bit of an eclectic blog, but I'm hoping that by doing this, I can reach out to um, different people. Um, so uh, I'm also on, on Facebook and Google Plus. I, um, I, I, I'm, if, if you Google E E Georgie, G-I-O-R-G-I, -E -G -G you'll find all these links.